Well, it seems as of late here on the Classic Reviews segment, I find myself going back to the year 1993. It was a pretty pivotal year in wrestling's history for very different reasons. In fact, last month I reviewed the first King of the Ring pay-per-view, which took place in June of that year as Hulk Hogan was on his way out of the WWF. And now I'm going to take a look at a WCW show from one month later that has some other interesting beginnings and ends. Time now to look at Beach Blast 1993 from July 18th at the Mississippi Coast Coliseum in Biloxi, Mississippi. This show was nominated by Ricky Temple and Uppers see you next Tuesday over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. It's the last Beach Blast show before it becomes Bash at the Beach, but that's not the only thing changing around here in WCW. Eric Bischoff is the new EVP of the company after Bill Watts' ousting, and so we are in a big transition period. As we head into this brave new era, the Disney MGM TV tapings are starting around this time as well. Some interesting Interesting things happening in WCW around this time. For instance, Ric Flair recently came back to the company after leaving the WWF. He's a babyface now. We'll see him later tonight. Interesting angle on TV they're pushing where the assassin Jody Hamilton is repeatedly badgering and harassing Dusty Rhodes about something. He basically keeps saying, say hi to your mother for me uh, toward Dusty, which of course, you know, that's just crossing the line. I'm not sure where that angle is going to go yet, but one other angle that's happening around this time that uh, I have a special place in my heart for are the lost in Cleveland videos. This is when Cactus Jack suffered amnesia after being powerbombed on the floor by Vader and he goes away for a long time and we get these kind of video skits happening taking place in a dark alley somewhere where this is a lady reporter trying to find where Cactus Jack is and we find out Jack believes he is a sea captain and to really drive that point home, every time you see him in his part of the alleys in these sketches, keep in mind you're supposed to be in this dark alley in this dense urban area, you hear the sound of seagulls squawking everywhere when Cactus Jack is talking about his days at sea and that to me is hilarious. I would love to do a deep dive more on specifically Lost in Cleveland. I have talked about the WCW mini movies which came out around this time and we will be talking about one of them when it comes to the main event very soon. 8,600 folks in the Coliseum on this night. About 100,000 pay-per-view buys. It's an interesting trend in WCW in 93 that all their pay-per-views drew roughly the same number of buys. And who made these graphics? They look terrible by 93 standards. Eric Bischoff and Missy Hyatt are dressed for the beach, kicking things off. They throw it down to Tony Schiavone at ringside, who then brings out Jesse the Body Ventura, who's hanging out at the Tiki Hut. The lights go out, they come back up, and you see Jesse making his way down to the ring with his Baywatch babes in arm. Jesse's wearing flip-flops. Tony's not even wearing shoes. The opening matchups for the World TV Championship as Paul Orndorff defends against Ron Simmons, the former world champion, and if Orndorff gets disqualified, he will lose the the title. Massive Paula chance before the match even begins. They have Paula pennants in the crowd. Were they selling those? That is amazing if that's the case. Orndorff throwing big elbows right into the mush of Simmons early on. Paul goes up top, but he is distracted by all the Paula chants. The diving attack misses and Simmons comes back. He attacks the leg and goes for a figure four, but Orndorff escapes, gets his shots in outside the ring and is back on top for a while. Ron hits a nice power slam. Paul with a thumb to the eye. The referee misses. He goes for the pile and driver near the ropes. Simmons backdrops Mr. Wonderful over the top rope and gets disqualified as a result. They keep fighting a bit after the bell. Simmons wins that exchange but is not the champion. I give it two stars out of five. What a great way to open this show with the dreaded over the top rope disqualification rule rearing its ugly head. And you're going to see guys go over the top rope a few times in this show and those other ones have nothing to do with disqualifications even if they're far more blatant than what you see in this matchup. It's kind of a cruel trick. I I guess that, you know, uh, Orndorff is doing all the chicanery and the cheating in this matchup, but it's uh, Simmons going a bit too far that causes the disqualification. Uh, yeah, the match itself was okay, but the DQ finish, I thought kind of soured me on it. Up next, a tag team match as Too Cold Scorpio and Marcus Alexander Bagwell in their awesome matching gear take on Tex Slazinger and Shanghai Pierce, the future Godwins slash Southern Justice. I love how in this matchup, the Cowboys main form of heat just yelling, Texas! over and over again, which gets booed, but of course the baby faces will go, Biloxi! Yay! And it reminds me of The Rock going, he said that's where we are from! That's our city! Scorpio tries to leap off Buff's back, but he slips right in the middle of the cool tracking shot. Whoops! They collect themselves after that and begin again. Jesse on commentary here, I will say I like the banter for the most part between Ventura and Shivani in this show, but, but Jesse starts calling the Cowboys the Texicans in this thing, and it took me a long time to figure out 
about. Is that their team name? Is he just like calling them Texans and Mexicans together? Because he, he refers to somebody else on this show as a Texican later on, and that confused me as well. So maybe that's just his catch-all term from people from Texas. It's kind of weird. Tex backdrops Scorpio into the friggin' stratosphere and he clips the ropes on the way down. Scorp comes back with a big crossbody. Bagwell on top of Pierce, then Slazinger. Baddies take over and now Marcus gets beat up for quite a while. He gets up from the sleeper, but right into a really cool gut wrench power bomb. Shanghai charges, but misses his target. Bagwell makes the hot tag and the crowd is hot for too cold. Big splash where he turns in midair. I love that. Big backdrop by Marcus and the 450 by the cold man. Team Babyface win. I give this one three stars out of five. This was a fun match. I think it was better than I ever expected it to be. I think Scorpio and Bagwell, just from this small sample size, are a pretty solid team, even though Bagwell is very, very green at this point in his career. But they work well together. I think Scorpio is so exciting at this point. And it's fun to see the Godwins before they became the Godwins. You know, I knew about those names kind of in the periphery of my mind, like doing occasional research. But seeing them in action here with this gimmick for the first time, I think is pretty neat. We go to the stage where we see Paul. Paul Orndorff with his new heavy, uh, Dave the Barbarian, looking at this guy. Orndorff says he always plays by the rules and that Simmons is a coward and a cheater. He should be fined and suspended for what happened in their match. He says he now has an equalizer called The Equalizer. He says someone to help him out, his good friend. He's just standing there looking mean. You can tell he just wants to have fun with his family and friends. Coming up next, young Eric Watts takes on Lord William Regal with Sir Steve. Wait, got those names mixed up. Starts off with some good back and forth here. Watts actually able to hold his own initially with a chain wrestling. Even Steve's impressed. Regal attacks the leg. He lays in some strikes. Watts makes a comeback. Goes for the STF but Sir William just leans in and slaps Eric in the face. How'd the referee not see that? Regal with a roll up with the tights and he wins the matchup. I'll give it one and a half stars out of five. My first thought after watching this match was, well, that was sudden. It sure felt really quick. I actually looked at the times on this show, and it's not the shortest match of the day. That actually goes to the following matchup, but I still thought it was very quick. It barely got into a second gear by the time uh, Eric put the STF on. And I will say, for as much as he was maligned during this part of his career for being kind of a Nepo baby and not really being ready for TV, I thought he held himself pretty well in this matchup. I thought he was relatively smooth and clean, and the stuff that he was doing, trading holds with Regal here, I thought was pretty well done. After the match, Jesse interviews his lordship, Regal saying he didn't even break a sweat in beating Eric while he is covered in sweat. He also calls out Paul Orndorff and his mission from the Queen to regain the TV title. Damn, Orndorff's name's getting said a lot tonight. Coming up next is a big grudge match as Max Payne takes on Johnny B. Bad, and this begins in the last Clash of the Champions when Payne shot Bad in the face with Johnny's own Bad Blaster, knocking him off the stage. Bad has shown up in the crowd at shows to taunt Payne in the weeks following this, wearing a hideous mask that made me unsure of who it was at first. Payne plays himself to the ring with Norma Jean. Van Hammer could never. Bad makes his way out to the ring, wearing what I thought would be an unworkable mask to wrestle in, but he does take that off. He's got a working mask under Underneath. Bad and Payne are swinging at the start. Bad flung over the top rope in the corner. Payne attacks the arm. At one point goes for his arm bar, the pain killer, but it was too close to the ropes. Bad fighting for a sunset flip. A drop kick. Max falls out of the ring and Johnny dives after him. Payne runs at him on the outside but throws himself into the steel ring post. Back in the ring, Bad goes up top, slips, up to the second rope for a rough looking cross body, the three count and the win. I give it two stars out of five. Like I mentioned, this is the shortest match on the show, just under five minutes, but even though it was an abbreviated match, I think they did a good job fitting as much action as they could in this thing. I give credit to Bad for really just bumping all over the place to make Max Payne look really strong in this one. Up next, a match for the WCW Tag Team Championships as Austin and Pillman, the Hollywood Blondes defend against the Horsemen, Arn Anderson and Paul Roma. Roma is the newest member of the Horsemen, somehow considered more legitimate of a Horseman than Jeff Jarrett. Hmm. Roma and Stunning Steve start things off here, and then Pillman goes out of the ring and jaw jacks with the fan. Horseman, baby! Ah! Roma punches Austin once in the face, and Austin goes flying from it. Arn with a blatant hair pull on Pillman. Jesse on commentary is in disbelief about the officiating and all these closed fists. The fans love seeing Arn outsmart Austin here. Very slow start to this match, by the way. Takes him a long time to get into any kind of gear. Brian has taken all sorts of offense for a while. Finally, a little bit of distraction from Austin 
Austin leads to Roma getting caught slipping. The Blondes take over. Austin does a little horseman gallop to taunt. A double down with Roma and Pillman leads to a hot tag for Austin and Arn. Arn getting worked over for a while. On the outside, though, he backdrops Austin on the floor. You ever notice that Steve Austin always took, like, one floor bump every match in his career, regardless of how messed up his body was. It's amazing. Armed with a sneaky roll-up, but Roma keeps the referee detained. Jesse the Jedi Ventura telling us that a wrestler should control their emotions. Austin is suplexed over the top rope to the outside, and Jesse is trying to make sense of the stupid over-the-top rule. Get over it, Tony says. And well, at this point, what choice do we have? Pillman with the flying nothing from more than halfway across the ring, but Arn hits him on the way down. Hot tag to Roma and Austin. Spinebuster in a close breakup of the pin. Austin grabbing Roma's tights though to win the match and retain the belts. I'm going to give it three stars out of five. This was a good, solid match. I think it went a little bit long and also had a really slow start, though. I'm not sure uh, why they would organize the card this way to have this match that goes for nearly half an hour, and then you follow that immediately with a match that is guaranteed to go a half hour. 30-minute Iron Man challenge for the vacant U.S. championship as Dustin Rhodes takes on Rick Rude. Rude was the U.S. champion until he got hurt the previous year and was made to vacate the belt. Dustin became the number one contender tender, making him the champion automatically. Rude came back from injury. They had some matches for the title, the last one ending in controversy when both men got their shoulders up at the same time. The belt was held up, and now this match will supposedly settle the score for the title. Dustin Control in the first five minutes or so of the match. Long-lasting holds in this one. Get used to this, folks. Rude with a camel clutch of his own, but Dustin is able to get him on his shoulders and drop him at around the 10-minute mark. A few minutes later, Rude hits the Rude Awakening to get the first fall. By around the 15 minute mark, Dustin's dumped to the outside and slammed on the ramp. Dustin avoids the count out and back to the chin lock. Dustin counters out of a tombstone, hits one of his own, but we get a kick out. Rude just works over Dustin for ages and Rude shouts, you ain't shit Rhodes! With about seven minutes to go, Rude locks in our 23rd long hold of the match, a sleeper. They do the hand drops, but we can't see what happens, but Jesse is screaming the hand drop the third time and the referee didn't call it. I guess we'll never know because the camera did not get a good shot of it. Rude really poured on the disrespect, doing a snot rocket on Dustin's gross. Three minutes to go, Dustin hits a bulldog from out of nowhere to score a pin and it's tied up. Dig that scoreboard. Dustin dodging a top rope attack, hits a DDT, but can't score the pin before time expires. The match ends in a draw and the championship remains upheld. I give it two and a half stars out of five. It's a tricky balance, a match like this, because you have this set amount of time and you have to use all your minutes, so you have to be able to pace yourself and not just go spot, spot, spot the whole way through because it's exhausting and you won't be able to make it, but you have to be able to balance that with the rest holds you do because they had so many long holds throughout this thing in order to pace themselves, and yeah, it looked like it was a big grind for both guys, but at the end, you just it, you kind of walk away with this kind of boring matchup and for it to end on a time limit draw, I thought was especially annoying. And keep in mind, we're still a few years away from the Iron Man match at WrestleMania 12, where at least they go to sudden death. In a match for the NWA Championship, Barry Windham defends against his old horseman buddy in Ric Flair. Barry calls himself a lone wolf now. He won the title at Super Brawl in February, but right after the match, Flair, who had just come back, he wanted to strap the belt on his former horseman mate, but Barry did not like that. These two had been fighting for months now, even fighting over a dressing room at one point. These former teammates and rivals going at it once again. I love how Rick's music stops playing mid-entrance for some reason. Flair with his trademark chops in the early going. Wyndham takes some time to powder and is able to overpower the Nature Boy. Flair makes a comeback, just hurls himself at Wyndham and he falls hard to the outside. Wyndham regains control. Big superplex. More back and forth. Flair flips over the turnbuckle for the second time in this matchup, but he makes it to the top rope, hits a move, but then his turn into a roll-up by Wyndham. Flair attacks the knee, gets the figure four locked in, referee counts the shoulders, the hand hits the mat three times, and after some confusion, the bell rings and Flair's declared the winner, becoming world champion for the tenth recognized time. I give it three stars out of five. I give them credit for moving with a lot of purpose in this matchup, working at a bit of a faster pace than what we saw in the previous two matches. Good to shake things up a little bit like that. It's an okay match, but I mean, when you compare it to the other matches that Flair and Wyndham had over the 
the years, like in the mid 80s. This does not match up to that. And it's sad because, you know, Barry Windham is somebody who I felt was given the nod with the world championship way past like the, the optimal point in his career, I would think. Pretty lackluster end to Wyndham's world title reign. Uh, it won't be long now, though, before the relationship between WCW and the NWA will dissolve. The NWA had a problem with the belt changing hands, you know, without their say-so, without their okay. And just before the Fall Brawl pay-per-view later in the year, the NWA pulled out of WCW, and the big gold belt was renamed the International Championship for a while. After the match, Jesse interviews Ric Flair at ringside. He puts over Wyndham, but says now it's time to style and profile. He lists off a bunch of names of potential challengers, saying that he lives and dies for the sport, and to prove that to be the man, you gotta beat the man. But now, folks, on we go to the main event, the match I'm sure you were all waiting for, as the superpowers take on the masters of the powerbomb. Sting and Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog, taking on Sid Vicious and Big Van Vader. Vader is the WCW champion, not to be confused with the NWA championship, though. Title not on the line here. Of course, the thing that precipitated all this conflict for this show just happens to be one of the most amazing mini-movies WCW ever produced. I've talked about this before in my episode about mini-movies with Cole Cabana. I will link that to you right here. But is, long story short, it begins with the Masters of the Powerbomb having a big rally to declare they are the Masters of the Powerbomb. Sting and Davey Boy did not show up for this rally, and so Colonel Robert Parker is now threatening Sting and Davey. Uh, to, they're they're going to beat him up and everything unless they retire. They take these plane tickets to the retirement haven of their choice. And so then you've got this moment here where Sting and Davey are playing volleyball with the kids for charity. And you've got Cheatham, the one-eyed midget, who's dressed as a shark and plants a bomb on a boat. And the boat blows up and you think Davey and Sting are dead, but they're not. It's just an amazing skit, amazing mini movie. It's like, it's so cheesy. And even then, a lot of people knew it was like corny to do. But it's one of those things that's so funny. It's so bad, it's good. Sid wearing flip-flops getting off like the boat on the beach and everything. Obviously, it doesn't do a very good job of making anyone involved look like serious or to be taken seriously. The skits that were done by Turner Home Entertainment kind of independently of WCW, it turns out, um, they're, they're all very special and unique in their own way. I loved Spin the Wheel, Make the Deal. I loved White Castle of Fear, and I love Beach Blast 93. It's just total camp. Sting off to a hot start, but immediately snuffed out with a single choke slam by Sid. Sting and Davey Boy go out of the ring, but climb to the top and do a double dive onto Sid and Vader. Vader works over Davey with big shots in the corner. Bulldog gets the big man up for a stalling vertical, though. Good Lord. Sid continues to wear down Bulldog for a while. Vader's tagged in. He and Sting get chippy. Vader even takes his mask off. Oh shit, it's going down now. Goes for a big sit on the Bulldog, but he misses. Sid clamps down on Davy Boy for a bit. Harley Race gets involved, but there's friendly fire and Race goes down. Big tag to Sting. He's doing well for a bit until he's hit by Sid at the apron. Walks into a big clothesline by Vader. Sting takes the big ham hocks from Big Van and is laid out. Going for a superplex, but Sting fights back, biting Vader in the face. Sting avoids a Sid elbow drop, tagging Davy Boy in. Vader splats Davy Boy with his bomb. Sting breaks up the pin, and then Sting and Sid go fighting on the outside. Vader follows up with a moonsault, but the quickness by Sting breaking the pinfall up again. Bulldog with a crucifix pin on Vader and pins to win. I'm going to give this one three and a half stars out of five. I think it's one of the better matches on the show. It certainly has the least controversy in it, as far as I'm concerned. I love the big boy athleticism involved in this thing from everyone involved. You know, they're all giant individuals, and they're all jacked, and they're all able to do some crazy athletic things. I love that stuff. Um, and the crowd was pumped for it the whole time as well. Even though the build for this match is just historically silly, I think the payoff for this match was pretty darn good, all things considered. It's crazy seeing Bulldog getting the pinfall victory over the WCW champion, and it never really leads to him getting any kind of major singles push in his time in the company. My grade for WCW Beach Blast 93 is is a C. Uh, this show took me in a lot of different directions here in terms of good and bad. There were some matches that I thought were good on paper but ultimately disappointed me and then there were some matches where I didn't really have any kind of preconceived notion or expectation going into it or just negative expectations and then really wowing me. So I think uh, ultimately though this is not a great 
ensemble for WCW in 93. You just go back one year and it's like night and day in terms of the quality of the matches they had and the stars they had. Uh, you know, things are shuffling around here. Like I said, it's a transition period. We are currently, you know, going from one EVP to another. So there's going to be some changes for sure. But I don't think this is a great example of what, w of what WCW is capable of at this time. But what did you think of Beach Blast 93, folks? What did you think of the whole show itself? The mini movie that led to the main event involving the small man and the shark fin and the exploding boat. I want to hear all about that in the comment section below. The next time here on the Classic Review, we jump ahead to the year 1997. ECW has finally got a couple of pay-per-view productions under its belt, and of course things are getting wild, dangerous, maybe even a bit extreme. We are going to look at Born to be Wired, but until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.